So uh, yesterday, I was attempting to import a quiz from uh, a Blackboard import course. And um, um, I imported the quiz, but not the question banks, which again are pools in Blackboard. And what I ended up getting was that uh, the quiz still showed the questions, uh, still showed the groups, but there were no questions in the groups because I didn't import the question bank. So I went back, I imported the question bank thinking it would link up with the quiz and it still did not. So I manually added those questions, which is fine because I wanted to show everyone how to do that. I also stepped through those, uh, those steps in the, in the workshop guide, um, but realized after um, the meeting, um, with my meeting with, with uh, Betty Thorne, that uh, what I actually did incorrectly was um, you need to import the quiz with the question bank at the same time. That's key. And if you do that, then the quiz will come over with the questions and the questions will be inside the quiz. So you don't have to manually add them after the fact. So um, I will do that again for another quiz, just to just to show uh, demonstrate that. Okay, so uh, I'm going to go ahead and I could do it from here. I'm going to add a quiz. Okay, I'm going to create the. Uh, I'm sorry. Oh, that's someone had a question. I'm going to create the quiz uh, from here. Okay, instead of going into my. Um, oh, actually, I'm sorry. I have to import it, don't I? Okay, so let me go to my home screen, and I will. I have to import it. So I'm going to import existing content. Okay, and I'm going to copy a Canvas course. And remember, whether you're copying an entire course or you're just copying pieces of the course you still choose the same copy of Canvas course. And then here where it says search for a course, you can select one of your old courses. So I'm gonna select the BB import programming for analytics. I'm gonna say select specific content. Okay, if you wanna copy the entire course, you would say all content. Otherwise you say select specific content and it still at this point will not let you select the content until you already choose the select the import button. So that's a little bit confusing because you actually have to click import before you can select the content. But you want to make sure you do say select specific content, then import. And then once you click on that, then it's waiting for the selection. So it's waiting on you now to make the selection of the uh, materials that you'd like to bring into your course. So I'm going to say select content. Okay. Now the quiz I want is the um, chapter three quiz. Okay. But in addition to that, I need to go to my question banks and I need to add the questions as well. Okay. So Chapter three, question four, chapter three, question two. Again, these are out of order. Um, it's just the way it shows up during the import. Uh, there's not much, unfortunately, I don't think you can do about the order. Okay, chapter three, question three. And I should have one more. Here it is, chapter three, question one. Okay, I'm gonna click the select content button. Okay, it's queued. It should be completed in a few seconds. And remember, the more that you bring in, the more time it may take. Okay, this one's taking a little long. It's still working. Let me go in the quiz to see if it's there. Oh, okay.
Okay, now it says completed. Let me go back to quizzes. Okay, here it is, chapter three quiz. And now if I click on it and I go to edit, hopefully all my questions should now be there. Okay, there they are. So it's pulling from these banks, okay, because these banks I imported along with the quiz. Um, some of the things you may need to update. So for instance, it says one point per question. Um, you know, you may want to, you may have to adjust this. For some reason, it didn't bring over the correct, correct number of points. And to change that, you just hit the pencil icon under that particular question group. And you just change it here. So you can say 25 points or however many points it is and update the group. To, and don't forget to save it. Hmm, it seems to be some performance issues today. It's taking long to do everything. Um, go back into quizzes. Yeah, it still thinks it's three points. It didn't save it, but that's okay. Let's go to the preview to make sure I can see the questions. And here they are. Okay, so the quiz is, you know, I do have to adjust some settings as I showed you the points, but otherwise all the questions and everything is here. Oh, it did update the 25 did, points. Uh, yeah. yeah, I don't know why it said three points on the front page. Okay. Okay, so that's that. Um, what I'm going to do next is, um, and, and by the way, if you want to add it to your module, just go back to your module, hit the plus button under the week or whatever unit you're using, go to quizzes and you should see it. And then just say add item. You may want to indent too. And now I have another quiz under quiz. Okay. Um, let me quickly go over the um, what are called the new quizzes. So this is a little bit confusing, one confusing part about Canvas. If you add a quiz, it's going to ask you, do you want a classic quiz or a new quiz? Uh, the quizzes that come over from Blackboard when you import them, those are classic quizzes. Okay. Um, but there's something called new quizzes, which is almost a completely different tool to build a quiz inside of Canvas, okay? Now, again, if you click on this link here, it will show you, uh, it opens in the same tab. I'm sorry, let me go back. I'm gonna open in another tab because I don't wanna lose this one. Okay, so it will show you the differences between um, the old and new quizzes. Or used to, where is it? Uh, that's interesting. This is a different page. Yeah, yes. Okay, I guess I gotta click this link here. Okay, they, they changed this. It used to bring you to a different page. I don't know why, but anyway, it's the same thing. Uh, basically, it's a table showing uh, what's in the, um, classic quiz versus the new quiz. Oh, it looks like, okay, they just updated this on 7 2021 mm -hmm. And they have something new called new quizzes by transition. Okay, I don't find it. To ease the transition from classic quiz to new quiz, an additional column new quizzes has been added. These items are on the current roadmap or milestones discussed in Classic quiz sunsetting timeline. Okay. I'm wondering if they're going to do away with the classic quiz. I, I know last I read that they weren't. So I don't know what the sunset timeline is. Being planned timeline to sunset. Okay. We understand nature. Okay. So it looks like classic quizzes will eventually go away. Removal of the class quiz database API support to be determined. Okay. Okay, so this, um, unfortunately, I'm gonna have to read more into this. I'm, I wasn't aware that they decided to 
do away with the classic quiz. All right, so I'm not exactly sure. Well, I guess by this, hopefully by this point, everyone will be, have already their, their Blackboard quizzes imported and then we can convert it from classic to new. Uh, but anyway, this table is showing the difference between each. And uh, as you can see, right, it almost looks like the classic quizzes are offering more. But uh, really, the, the main uh, points we want to look at here are the type of questions. And there's really no difference between the type of questions. Let's see, which content editor? Okay, so it looks like the new quizzes do not support the rich content editor, but they will by the time we transition. Uh, these are the, let's see, here it is. These are the question types. So you can see all the question types are supported by both, but the way that you build the questions are a little bit different. So if I were to say a new quiz here and hit submit, um, I think I showed yesterday how you could create essay questions, multiple choice questions, true or false from the classic quiz. You'll see they'll look a little bit different here in the new quiz. Um, settings are very similar. So you set your points, you set your assignment group, you set how you want it displayed. Um, so you still have the complete incomplete percentage points. Um, submission type, it says external tool. Uh, the reason it says this is because it sees the new quiz tool as an external tool. So you don't really have to do anything here. Uh, they even disable it so you can't click it. Um, you can do the anonymous grading. Um, and then now there's no tab for questions. Notice the question tab is gone. There's also a lot of other uh, options that we don't see here, but we can see them once we actually click on build. So when you click on build on a new quiz, so we do have to put a name here, just call this new quiz one. And when we say build here, it will bring you to another page which has a bunch of tabs, okay? So this is where we build our quiz. This is where we can add instructions, okay? It is not the rich content editor. So we did see that that was not included. Although it does support, let's say, uploaded media, it's links. So it does have some of the same features there. Um, now it has a settings tab. So some of those settings that we saw in the classic quiz that were missing from the new quiz, you can now see here in the settings tab, but you do have to go and build the quiz first. So shuffle the questions, shuffle the answers, one question at a time, uh, access code, time limit, all of these are now in settings. Okay. Um, reports, I'm not sure exactly, because I haven't used the new quizzes, but I guess you can look at some uh, analyses here about the quiz. And then moderate is like the moderate we saw in the classic quiz. This is where you would want to add extra time if a student has accommodations. And my understanding is uh, from this page that if you um, give a student extra time on a quiz, it will actually carry over to the other quizzes. So you do not have to, um, uh, you do not have to set it for each additional quiz like you do with the classic quiz. And again, this is my first time looking at this table, but it's probably somewhere here where it says um, the accommodations will carry from quiz to quiz. Okay, so if you click moderate here and then you can set your additional uh, attempts or time adjustments, and then this should be, right, as you go, uh, you create another quiz, It that's supposed to stay, so you don't have to set it for each one. Okay. All right, is there a math type feature found it? Okay. Um, okay, well, I'm glad you found it. I'm not sure what, uh, Martha, what you mean by that. Uh, oh. do you want Because I teach math and I need to be able to type equations and things of that sort but it's there okay if you go back to um add instructions i think it was mm -hmm. 
way on the end where it says FX. That's okay. The math, that's the math editor. Oh, excellent. Thank you. Uh, okay. Um, okay. So once you've done, now we can add our questions and let's see, we may have to go create an item bank. No, where would be the adding of the questions? Okay, new quiz one, maybe this is just instructions. Oh, you probably have to hit the plus sign here. Yep, okay. So we hit the plus sign. This is where we can add our questions. So these are all the different question types. As I mentioned, um, you know, they're, they're very similar to the, to the classic quiz. So for instance, if we do a multiple choice, right? They have you put in the question here. And then you can put in your answers here. Answer one, answer two, right? So on and so forth. And then you select which one is the correct one. There are a few other options here. Show on-screen calculator, uh, vary points by answer, shuffle choices. Um, now, I also want to show, so we can say done here. Oh, I guess I have to put in some more answers. Okay. Now, if we want to add a essay question, okay, because I did one of these yesterday. Um, let's say this is the question. And for this one, you can actually put in the um, correct answer. Although now I'm not, oh, here it is. Okay, so for the essay, if you click on the, um, the bubble here, it will allow you to put in a correct answer, an incorrect answer, or just general feedback. If you remember the classic quiz only had the general feedback. So regardless of what they answered, they would see that. With the new quiz, you can actually put a correct and incorrect answer. Um, so this is, this is an advantage of the new quiz. Okay. Uh, are the same types of quiz available in new quizzes, practice, graded survey? Yes, yeah, they, um, it's a good, actually, that is a good question. I think I saw that, but let me just double check. Let's go back to the, um, let's say return. Okay. By the way, the icon is a different color. So that's how you know it's a new quiz versus an old quiz. Mm. But let me take a look and see if, oh, okay. Maybe they don't have the graded survey. I would have to look into that. Chris, do you know uh, if new quizzes have the graded survey? I don't see that as, a, as an option. Let's see if it's here. Create survey. No, unfortunately not. They don't have that for the new quiz. So that is something you're missing, uh, unfortunately. Sorry, Elizabeth, it doesn't, it shows it doesn't have it. Okay. Um, the other thing that the new quiz does not have are the question banks. Okay, so the question banks that, um, yeah, sorry about that. Uh, now, again, search the, um, search the community. There's an infrastructure community uh, for Canvas and um, it's very good. I, I don't think I've ever had a question I couldn't find on this. Um, or even if you search Google, usually the answers will come up inside of the community page. Uh, you can search for, you know, maybe it's just, even though there may not 
be a graded survey, someone may have some type of a workaround. So um, that may be something to search for there. Now, one of the things that uh, the new quiz does not have are the question banks, okay? Instead, the new quiz have item banks. But unfortunately, the, the, pool, the question pools from Blackboard come over as question banks. They do not come over as item banks, okay? So if you wanna build your pools, you have to do that inside of the item banks um, from scratch. Even if you were to, I'm not sure if Chris is, uh, Chris, you still in the room? Um, okay, so he may have stepped out, but um, in the last session, um, we, we saw that you can actually convert your classic quiz to a new quiz. Okay, so if I take this chapter three quiz, and um, Again, I'm in the quiz page here. So if I click the quizzes on the left, it brings up the quiz page. I hit the three dots and I can click on migrate. And I can convert this to a new quiz. Okay. And if I click on it now and go to build, Oh, I guess I have to put a due date here. That's good. Okay, if I go to build. Okay. Oh, this is another problem. The questions go away. So yeah, basically the, the, the bad news is if you convert a essay quiz to a new quiz, um, there are a lot of issues. For one thing is the questions are gone. Um, there is a way to keep the questions, but you need to, um, you have to build the quiz like I did yesterday. So if you do the import and you bring in the question banks with the quiz, um, then and then you convert it to a new quiz, you get something like this. So what you would need to do is in your classic quiz, you'd actually have to build the quiz a little bit different. Okay, you can have the question group pull from the bank. You actually have to create the group with the questions. So for example, if I were to say new question group, and I'll just call this group four. And I have to say, I, if, I'm not going to link. Instead, I'm going to create the group. I'm sorry. I'm, let me cancel this. I'll do it this way. I'm going to find my questions. Okay. And I'll do chapter three, question four. Well, that only has one. I'll just put the same ones here. Select these. I'll do, do a new group. I'll call this group four. I'll click create group. Why did it fail? Okay, that's interesting. Maybe I have to do the other. Okay, so I'll pick one question, one point. Okay, that's probably what I did. Okay, so I'll add my questions. Okay, notice when I did it that way, instead of saying it's gonna be pulled from this bank, it actually shows the questions in the group. Okay. So now I'm gonna save this. So there's two ways to pull in the question groups. You can link it to, to, a, to a question bank like I did here, or you can create the group and select the questions from the bank like I did here at the bottom. And it's still saving. All right, now. Let's go back, hopefully it's saved. Still says three questions, but let me preview, maybe it's still there. Okay, good, it still has my question four. So it's acting a little wonky today, okay, So, but it's there now. All right, so now I'm gonna go back to my quizzes and I'm going to delete this quiz three 
And let me go ahead and migrate this one. There it is. And now if I go to build, did this again, okay. Okay, my question four is there. Okay, and if I were to preview, I don't know if it'll let me preview because I had that error, but um, I should see question four. Okay. Oh. Anyway, um, question four will show up. Notice there's no error on question four. And again, that's because I created the group and I added the questions instead of creating the group and linking the questions. Unfortunately, when you do the import, like I showed at the beginning, it will actually create the groups and link the questions. And if you do a conversion, it doesn't work. So I wish I, I, wish I had better news, unfortunately. And I actually did not know that they were going to do away with the classic quizzes. So hopefully by the time they do have this transition that um, they will have fixed this. But, um, but anyway, so that's, that's all I really uh, have to say about the, the new quizzes. Okay, any questions on that before I move forward? Okay. All right, the next thing I'm gonna show is how we could bring in some assignments from a third party platform. So if you use uh, Pearson or if you use McGraw-Hill or Cengage like I do, it's all pretty much the same thing. I mean, they, they all have their own separate apps. So there are some subtle differences between each, but for the most part, the way it handles the importing of the uh, assignments are, are very similar. So, um, let me come out of here. And the first thing you want to do is you want to go into your settings and then your navigation tab. And you'll notice in the navigation tab, it has apps for all of these different publishers. So we have McGraw Hill, Chicago Press, Pearson, My Labs, Engage. Um, if you don't see your publisher here, you could um, go to the apps tab and you can see if you can bring, if they have an app, because that's really all those are. So um, um, I can't think of another publisher offhand, but, but again, here are all of these apps and you can see, right, the different, um, like here is Cengage, but of course that's already brought in. Here's Chicago Business. But there's probably some here that you didn't see in that list. So you can, um, here's Flat World, I'm familiar with those. So Flat World wasn't in the list, but if you use Flat World, for example, you can click on this and load this app. And then you should be able to see it in your uh, navigation here. Okay, now I use Cengage. So I'm gonna go ahead and bring this up to my list at the top. Now, again, this doesn't mean that the students will see this, only I will see this, uh, even though it's up at my top list and I click save. And then Cengage will show here on the left. So I click on that. And now it's going to ask me, now this again will look a little bit different depending on the platform you use. Um, but since I use Cengage MindTap and it says here, I'm gonna add the MindTap platform. I'm gonna click this button, add homework platform. If you use MindTap, uh, the nice thing about MindTap is you can bring in multiple court, multiple books um, in your course. And this, you just have to let the students know they use the Cengage Unlimited uh, subscription. Um, and Pearson, I think is you can only have one. And th those are the two that I've used. Um, but if you use Cengage, you do have to let um, your Cengage representative know if your book is enlisted here. Okay, so if you don't see your book, contact your Cengage rep and say, hey, can you please add the book to my Canvas? 
and they can do it. Um, so in this particular class, I use marketing and MIS, and I also use, um, see there's two different editions, 20th edition, I don't know why there's two here. Okay, so I use marketing, I use the MIS, and I also use uh, the illustrated collection. So I'm, I'm gonna go ahead and just link the MIS book for now. Okay, so I click link to course. Okay, now I actually haven't built this course yet in mind in um, in mind tap. But one of the nice things about this is, if you haven't built the course, you can create it new or you can copy from an existing course, which I'm going to do. And I just taught it over the summer. So I know the course in the summer is my most recent one. So I'm just going to copy that one. And um, my start date is 818. I'm going to change this to 820. That's the first day of class for me. Um, if you also use MindTap, you do have to make sure that the start date is the first day of class because if they get a free trial, I think it's a week free trial, the free trial starts on the start date. Pearson, if you use Pearson My Lab, I remember Pearson My Lab's a little different. The start date, the, the, the free trial starts on the day they register. So for Pearson, um, I think, I'm sorry, somebody I think has their mic on that I'm hearing. So I'm going to see if I could um, disable that. Um, okay, I'm the only mic I see. So I'm not sure why I'm hearing a mic, someone else. Okay, I could, I could do a mute all. And then if you want, I could um, unmute. Oh, allow for this. Mute all. Okay, let's we'll see if that works. All right, so with Pearson, it's um, as, as soon as the student signs in and registers, that's when the trial begins. So if you're using Pearson, you could probably have an earlier start date. But with MindTap, you want the start date of the first day of class. And then the end date, I'm actually just going to make the last day of the summer. OK. And the course name, I'm going to change this to SOBA203, MIS. And I'll make this um, spring 2021. I'm sorry, we're going into the, the fall. 21. Okay. And I will then go ahead and continue. Okay. So if I Cengage, okay. So Martha, what you need to do is contact your Cengage representative. Um, I know ours in the business school is uh, David Steely. Um, but if you work in a different department, it may be someone else. Um, but um, and that's the confusing thing because it's actually them that add it to Canvas because it's their app. It's not IT. So you have to tell Cengage to add it um, and just email them and, and they should be able to do it for you. Um, if you can't, if you don't know who you're, if you're representative, I, I can look it up. Um, it's on their web page somewhere. Okay, sure. Um, the add activity score and add overall scores. This depends on which grade book you're using. And by the way, you can always change this later. So you don't have to worry too much about this when you're setting it up. But the add activity scores, if you want, if you're using the grade book in Canvas and you want to bring in those grades individually and, um, and, and average those in Canvas, that's the one you want to choose. If you're using the grade book in MindTap or in your third party tool, and you would like to just show maybe the average uh, or the overall scores inside of Canvas, you would choose the second one. But again, you can always change this later. It's not a, you know, it's not set in stone. Okay, so I'm gonna continue that. Okay, so now it's, it's actually building my, my Cengage course at the same time as doing the integration with, um, with Canvas. So if I were to go now into um, MindTap,
By the way, uh, if you do use MindTap, they updated their interface a bit. Uh, there are a few, there are some things that are different with the MindTap. Um, for one thing, they sort of did away with the concept of a master course. So the old system used to have a master course and you can build your courses off of the master. And if you notice what I did is I actually built my course over a section course from the summer um, because there's really no master anymore. Um, so if you go to my courses, it will list all your courses and um, there's also no way to delete a course. So this is the one I just built, the fall 2021 course. And um, I can view the sections here. So in a sense, they built the master and this is the section one and now it's LMS linked. Um, there's also no option to delete a course like you could in um, the older interface, which is a problem because if you ever link a course accidentally, you know, let's say you link it to a different course. Um, the way I used to solve that is I used to just delete the course and then relink it. Um, but now they don't let you delete it. So uh, I did reach out to Cengage about that. And they said, if from this, if you go, you can actually go back to the classic view and which expires on the 15th of October. And there you can still have all the features that the old classic view had. And they said, by the time it does expire, the, the new view will have the, <clears throat> all of the features such as deleting a course that the old one used to have, okay? But anyway, so here's my course, I can click in it. And it should be set up the same way I had it in the summer. So all the same assignments um, that I'm giving the students. Uh, the only thing that's different is I don't believe it will keep the, the due dates because of course it's a different semester. All right, so yeah, so here's, here's all the assignments, but the due dates are gone. So I'll have to go through this and just set up the due dates to be for the fall 2021. But I could do that after the fact. Um, if I go back to my canvas, okay, now this question is, okay, well, now how do I bring in these assignments? Because I have some review questions that I like to give them. I have another assignment called use it, another one called you make the decision. And um, I don't want to have to give them, you know, a login for canvas and a login for mind tap. So I'd like to integrate it. And by linking the course, like I just did, it allows me to do that. So now the question is, well, how can I post these assignments from within Canvas? So all you need to do is just go back to that same screen that you did, you went to to set up your course. So that would be the Cengage link. Okay, now notice I have the platform that I've already added. I don't see all the other books. It doesn't mean I can't add more books. If I do add homework platform, I could go ahead and add the additional books. And there's two other books that I use. So eventually what I'd like to do is add those in too. But this is the one that I just linked, okay? And if I click select content, what I will see is the same layout that I have here inside of my MindTap. All the same modules that I'm assigning the students. Okay, so here they are. And then when I exp expand it, now I can see all of the same assignments that I saw on my tab. And I just simply click on the ones I wanna bring in. So um, I'll bring in, you make the decision. I'll bring in, actually, let me bring all of these in. Okay, because two of these I give for homework and then two of them I do in class. Notice when I check them on the left, it does check on the right, which means it's going to add it to the grade book. Remember, I selected to add each individual um, um, assignment to the grade book. That's what that does. You, and then you can change it to overall score. Remember I said you can always change it later. You can switch it if you need to from here. But I do add each one individually because I used the grade book in Canvas. I do not use the one inside of um, MindTap. Another thing I want to mention is be very careful if you, if you use something like this, uh, be very careful about the points. Okay, see where it says six points, one point, and 10 points? That's actually how it's going to be brought over to Canvas. The way it used to be in Blackboard is I was able to convert it to a percentage in Blackboard. So if they got a six out of six in MindTap, it would basically be 100% in Canvas. I'm sorry, in Blackboard. Canvas also allows you to put the percentage, but 
when you have the um, average column, the average column does take into account the points, even if you're using the percentage <clears throat> to show the students in the grade book. So that's one difference between Blackboard and Canvas. So be very careful of that with your third party integrations. Okay, so actually what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to this because I don't want to bring them in until I change the points. So I'm just going to do that very quickly here. And maybe to save time, I'll just go ahead and just change to. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and change this to 100 points. Okay, and I'm gonna do the same thing for, okay, so that's a hundred points. And let me do the same thing for the, for the use it. And I didn't realize this, well, yeah, I, I don't know why. So I think I changed it in the old one. I don't know why I didn't carry over, but that's okay. <clears throat> okay, so now I'll go back here, select my content, and I changed, I brought, I wanna bring in the review questions and the use it, hit continue. Okay, import completed. Okay, now once you've done the import, it just takes you back to your homepage. So the question is, okay, well, where are these assignments? What they do is they create a module because remember in Canvas, everything's a module. So if you go into your modules page, okay, you will notice at the very bottom, here's the um, assignments it brought in from the mind tap. So I have my module one review questions, my use it, Okay, they both say 100 points. That's important. Make sure, right, it does line up with your Canvas gradebook. Um, they also give me a link to the um, to the MindTap course itself, which is good. I, I want to actually use this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring this link up here. I'm just going to drop it in week one because what I want them to do is register in week one, and maybe I'll keep that link in there so they can click in and register. And then these individual assignments. I'm going to drag up here. So the review questions I'll do in class. And then the use it, I will give that for homework. Okay. Now, now it's just an empty module. So you can just delete it. Every time you do an import, it is going to create a new module. So after you copy the stuff over, you can just delete it. Another thing you want to make sure of is when you do import the assignments, make sure you do have them categorized correctly on your assignments page. So it will show under imported. Um, I'm sorry, under where is it? Uh, oh, okay. it went over under homework. So my review questions, I want to make sure it goes under in class. Okay. Notice it also has the migrated quiz and the imported quiz that I So you may want to move those over to make sure you move those if you're importing and migrating quizzes. Okay, so let's go back to modules. And that's it. So now what happens when the student clicks in the assignment, they do not have to uh, log in to MindTap. It has what's called a single sign on. So as long as they're registered with your Canvas course and they register with MindTap, we'll automatically link it. And you click on this button and it opens the assignment as if it's opening from Canvas. Sometimes they don't even know they're going into that third party platform. And then once they complete the assignment, okay, here it comes. Okay, start the assignment. And then once they complete this, and they submit it, they're gonna get a grade, of course, in MindTap, but also because you have that link in there and it's linked to your Canvas course, 
you will also see it here in your gradebook. See, so it says module one, use it, and um, module one, review questions. Okay, let's see. Um, could you please clarify for me, if I have six points in one quiz and one point in another in a third party application, and the student gets 100 on quiz one and one point on quiz two, what percent would Canvas show? Six out of seven. Yeah, so Canvas will actually show the points. And what you can do is you can change it to percentage. So, okay, I'm sorry. It looks like it does show it as percentage, Valerie. You can change it to points if you wanted to. I keep mine as percentage, but you just have to realize that um, the average column over here is going to show the average based on the points. So let's say you have 200 points in one and 300 points in another, it will average X number out of 500 points instead of averaging those percentages. And that's why I was saying how the gradebook book works a little different here in Canvas than it does Blackboard. So for me, what I had to do is make everything 100 points. So um, let's see if I answered that correctly. So six points on one quiz, one point on another. Uh, they get 100 on quiz one, which means they got six out of six points, right? And one point on quiz two, which also means 100. Bill, I, yeah, I typed that wrong. I, th I meant to type a zero on the second quiz, uh, which was worth one point. Okay. But you answered my question, which is that they're going to take six sevenths, which is like 86%, instead yes. of being 100% plus 0% over two. Right. Correct. Okay. Yeah. So you have you have to be careful with that. Uh, I, I Unfortunately, I didn't realize it because I used this the first time over the summer. And I was seeing that there were some students, for instance, that didn't submit homeworks uh, that still had pretty high homework averages. And I'm like, how is that happening? And I realized because those homework assignments were one or two points, right? Where other homework assignments that they were submitted may have been like 10 points. So it wasn't, you know, it didn't have that much of a dent in their average. But in my grade book, I was showing all the average scores. So, so that didn't make sense because it didn't work like Blackboard. And, and you will see too, as the scores start to populate, when you highlight your mouse over a specific average, it will say this out of this many points and will show you the percentage of that. So, um, so I hope that helps. Um, Cause that was, that was an issue that, that I saw over the summer. Can students click on publish your name on the left menu and get to a third party platform, Spitzman Blackboard? Uh, yes, I could show you. Um, I could show you how to do that, Michelle, and that's using an app. So here's what you may want to do, um, Michelle. Let me show you another app since we're on the subject of apps, um, how you could have a link on the left hand side to link to a publisher or really link to anywhere like you can in Blackboard. Okay, I'm going to do, actually, I think I have this saved somewhere. So let me go to my files. Okay, good. So I have something called a file here called MindTap. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do exactly what Michelle's asking here. I'm going to create a page Okay. So I go to view all pages. I'm going to add a page. And I'm going to call this page MindTap. And I'm going to put this in here. It says this the e-text as well as in-class and homework assignments are available through MindTap Learning Platform. You may register and access MindTap using the link below. And here I have MindTap. Okay. Now, if you may have noticed, I did have that link to the course that it gave me. When you bring over the assignments, it will actually give you a link to the course too. And I put that in my week one module. So what I can do is I can highlight this, go to a course link, okay, go to my modules. Here's my week one. 
Oh, it doesn't look like, okay. So I have to do a little bit different because I can only link to an individual module. That's okay. I'm going to leave this the way it is for now. I'm going to click save. Okay. And I'm going to go back to my modules page. And this is a link that will open that course, Michelle. So if you click on this link and click on this button, it will bring you to the MindTap course. And this is good to have because if a student hasn't registered yet, like on the first day of class, you can say click on this link. And because as an instructor, you're of course registered for it, it will bring you to the course, but it will bring them to the registration screen. Okay, so what you can do is, let's go back here. If you right click on this link on your mouse, you can say copy link. Okay, and what that's gonna do is it's gonna copy it to the clipboard on your computer. And now if I go to back to my pages and I go to view all pages. Okay, here's my mind tap. So I wanna edit this one. Okay, now I'm going to select this. I'm gonna click on the link button. I want an external link this time. And for the link, I'm gonna do a control V, okay? And this is actually the link that's gonna open up that MindTap course. Click done, hit save. I'm gonna actually, I'll save and publish it. Okay, so now if I click on this link, Okay, it brings me to the same place. It opens up MindTap, so that's good. Okay. Okay, good, that worked. Okay, so now, Michelle, you asked, okay, well, I wanna put on the left-hand side here. So when they click on it on the left, it's gonna bring them to this page and then they can click on MindTap. Okay, so to do that, Unfortunately, it's not built into Canvas. It is an external app that you need to load. So if you go to your settings on the left-hand side, click on apps, okay? There's an app called Redirect. Okay, you have to type that in the search for, it's called Redirect. And here it is here, it's called Redirect Tool. You click on that, and then you're gonna say add app. Okay, and it's gonna ask for the name. The name is what's going to appear in your navigation. Okay, so I can call this MindTap. The URL is the URL that is going to link to. Now, I did not copy the URL. I forgot to do that. I'm just gonna leave this blank for now. Um, make sure that you do show in course navigation. That's important. And we're gonna say add app. Okay, and now if I go to my navigation, okay, and well, it's not here yet. You probably have to do a refresh. Let me refresh my page. Here it is. Mind tap is now down here. Okay, so you do have to do a refresh to see it. Okay, now when I click on this, what I'd like it to do is open the um, mind tap page, but remember I didn't put the URL in there. So it says URL is not provided. So now what you want to do is go back to your pages. Okay, go to view all pages. Click on your mind tap page. This is the URL up here in your browser. So just copy it, do a control C to copy. Now we have to go back to our settings, go back to our apps. I need to click on the view app configurations button. This is going to allow me to put that URL inside of that redirect tool. Okay, so now I have to go down to my mind tap. Here it is. Okay, now these are all the apps that you have installed, even if you didn't install them or not. IT installed a lot of these for us. So, uh, you know, you see your McGraw Hill here and your Chicago business. Those you can't do anything with, but the one that I added, which is the mind tab redirect, it does allow me to edit it. And now I'm going to put in my, oops, here's the URL right here. It's under custom fields. 
put that in there. What you really want to do though is when you set up the redirect, have this URL ready so you can paste it in there. Hit submit. Okay. So now if I go to MindTap, I have it on the left hand side. I click on it. it brings me to um oh oh I copied the wrong URL. I'm sorry. Well, this is another way to do it. I actually copied the, <laughs> I guess I still had the link to the course in my, in, my, um, in my clipboard. I must not have copied the correct URL. Sorry about that. So using, is it already in Canvas? Yeah, it is already in Canvas. Again, you just have to go to your settings and go to your navigation. And there's two McGraw Hills actually, there's connect and SimNet. I'm not sure which one. Oh, you say connect, okay. So what you want to do is you want to bring connect up to your navigation here. Now this is going to give you the link to the McGraw Hill app so you can link your textbook. Okay, so that's what you're going to use to link your textbook and also to bring in the assignments that you want to bring in. Okay, again, that's going to look a little bit different than the um, than the MindTap app. So if I click on McGraw Hill Connect, right? Looks a little different. It says McGraw Hill Campus request access to your account. You do have to authorize it first. Um, I think you just click authorize, it will work. I've never used this before. So, okay. And then you click begin and then it brings you here. So I guess you have to, it will bring you to their page. So they have a little bit of a different process than the MindTap, but all in all, it should be fairly similar um, once you log in. Okay, so my students can use this as well, or do I have to go through pages? Well, what will happen is once you have it connected to the course, once you have it linked to the course, then what you can do is you can bring in, well, at least the way it works with MindTap is, I'm sorry, I want Cengage. The way it works with Cengage is once you have established the link, then it allows you to select the content. When you select the content, it will give you links to the content you selected, as well as a link to your um, actual course. So that's what it does with MindTap. If that doesn't work for you, Michelle, you just well, you can reach out to me and I can work with you uh, on an individual basis. Um, but again, since I work with MindTap, it did give me a link to the course, as well as links to the assignments. Okay, so. But let me just try this one more time. So if I go to pages, view all pages, mind tap. Okay, this is the one I want. Control C, let me go back to my settings, apps, view app configurations, edit. No, it does say MindTap. That is the URL. I don't know why it didn't. Maybe it just gave me the button to do it. So maybe that's what it is. It says, oh, now it worked. That was weird. Okay. Well, anyway, so now MindTap is on the left. So now a student should be able to see that, I think. Oh, no, I still have to bring it up. All right, well, once I bring it up to the student list, then they will see it on the left and then they can click on it and register for MindTap on the first day of class. And, and this, by the way, this redirect will work with any of your pages, right? Because your pages is really a website. So, um, so any of the, uh, of, of the pages that you create, like I created this MindTap one, you can create a link on the left using redirect tool and it works just like Blackboard. So if you like your own custom links on the left, which, which Canvas is not giving you by default, you can still do it, okay? Just use the redirect tool. And by the way, you have to load redirect for each link that you want. So if you want another link on the left-hand side, you have to go back into your settings, click on your apps, and you have to find redirect again and add another redirect tool. So every link you want on the left-hand side will be a different redirect tool that you will need to load, okay? And then you would add the app and put in the URL 
of the page that you want to redirect them to. Okay, and then of course change the name because the name is what's going to be listed on the left hand side. Okay, so that's it. I'm at 11 o'clock. Um, I what I can do is I know some folks asked about Zoom and Respondus, so I can go over that in the um, in the meantime. If you have to leave, you can. If you, but if you're interested in seeing how to use the Zoom or the Respondus, you can you can stay. Um, the nice thing about Zoom is that it is included in Canvas. Uh, we didn't have that in Blackboard. In Blackboard, um, you had to manually add Zoom, load it in, like we did here with Redirect, and then schedule your classes. And a lot of instructors didn't realize, and they just kind of used their own Zoom app. Uh, um, but you don't have to, because um, Zoom meetings right here in Canvas, OK? So if you click on Zoom meeting on the left hand side in Canvas, um, it will bring up the Zoom app on the right hand side. If you use Zoom in Blackboard, um, the integrated Zoom, it's the same thing, um, exactly the same thing that you're seeing here. If you've never used it, I'll show you how to do it. So what you want to do in Zoom is um, you want to schedule your meetings, your class meetings, and once you schedule them, when the student clicks on Zoom meeting on the left, they'll see a list of your class meetings and then they just join the Zoom call. And um, this happens automatically. They don't have to sign into Zoom or anything like that. The only way they can get to the class, to, to your Zoom class is through Canvas. So you don't have to worry about an outsider coming into your class and anything like that, okay? It's a really nice feature. So what you wanna do is you wanna schedule a new meeting, okay? Click on that. And then you want to put a topic. Now, the topic by default is going to be the name of your class. Now, what I like to do, and it does take a little bit longer do, doing it this way, but I actually create a separate meeting for every class and it coincides with my class schedule. So if I bring up my, um, um, my syllabus here, Okay, so what I would do now, if this was an online class, okay, this one, of course, will be on campus. But what I would do is I would schedule a meeting for A25, and I'll call it MIS Chapter 1, Lecture 1. Okay, so you could do that. The reason I do this is because it's easier for the students to go back and see the classes they missed. If you just make it a recurring meeting, then, and then they all have the same name, and it may be hard to figure out you know, what class they need to go back and review. So this is the way I do it. And then you, of course, you just put whatever date that meeting will be. So 823 and then the time. So this one meets at, I think, 11. Okay, how long it's going to be. Now, if you want to do a recurring meeting, let's say you just want class meetings and you meet every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or every Tuesday, Thursday, you just click on recurring meeting. And you would say repeat every week. And then you choose the days that it repeats. So you would say Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or Tuesday, Thursday. Make sure this has the first day of class in the when field. And then the end date, this should be the last day of class. Okay. Uh, I don't seem to have Zoom list. Oh, okay. Um, it should be there. Uh, if you don't see it, um, go into your settings and then under navigation and see if you see it listed at the bottom. You may have to drag it up. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll get to that in one second. Sorry, um, Janardin. Okay, so um, registration. This is if, um, actually, well, I'm confused about what this is. It, it, as long as they're in the class, they don't have to be registered. They can access it, okay? Passcode, again, you don't really need the passcode because you're going through Canvas to get there. So they have to be registered in class to, to actually, a, a lot of these settings, by the way, are just standard Zoom settings, which really you don't have to worry about with the Canvas integration. Waiting room, if you want them to be in a waiting room. Authenticated users, well, they again, they have to be in the class to get in. So you don't have to worry too much about that. Video, if you want to have the video come on automatically. 
uh, audio, telephone, computer, or both. I always do computer audio because when you do telephone audio, they tend to call in in the car or something. And then sometimes they don't know how to mute. And um, I'd rather them be sitting at the computer, right? Attending class. So I just do computer audio. And then there are a few other meeting options here, mute participants upon entry and so on and so forth. And, uh, and that's it, and then we save it. Okay, once you save it, by the way, you can do polls. Um, polls, unfortunately, are, I don't know if you've used polls in, 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 Cam in Zoom before. It's not as nice as the Blackboard Collaborate polls, which you can do on a fly. With polls in Canvas, you have to download a template and use that template to put in your poll questions. And you can download that here. Once you've downloaded it and made your necessary uh, adjustments to it or modifications, then you just import the CSV and you can start up the poll inside of Zoom. Okay. But that's it. Now, once you have done that, then you go to course meetings or you can just click on Zoom meeting again. And here it is. Now, if I did a recurring meeting, you would see all your meetings here. Okay. Another thing is if you want to edit it, just click in it. Okay. And then go down to the bottom and say, edit this meeting. Another thing you may want to do, which I missed in my settings is record the meeting automatically in the cloud. This is something that Blackboard Collaborate didn't have. And there are many classes that I forgot to hit the record button on. Um, this is nice because it will automatically record it and it will record it in the cloud, which means that um, once you have done with your meeting, it will show up here under the cloud recordings link and it will be here automatically. So you can tell your students if you miss class, go to Zoom meetings, go to cloud recordings and it will be here, okay? With COVID being the way it is, um, this is maybe one of the best solutions to actually record your class even in the classroom. So you may wanna have your Zoom meeting scheduled anyway, even if it's not an online class. And you can tell your students if you're not feeling good, um, just stay home and join the Zoom call. And then they can watch it on Zoom and then record it too. And then this way we'll be in your cloud recordings. Um, if you uh, are using a classroom with the Matrox system, IT will record that automatically too. And they will, put, you just have to send them an email and let them know what class you want record, recorded and what classroom you're going to be in. And then what they'll do is you will find a page inside of pages that will have your um, class recordings. They'll put that in there automatically. They'll also give you a module. So if you want to put in your module, keep it in your modules, we'll be there too. And all your class recordings will go there automatically. And that's your in-class recordings from the matrix. Okay, so you, you can have a Zoom recording and an in-class recording. And they can watch either one, but for them to attend it in person or attend it remotely rather, um, Zoom meeting, at least IT told me that Zoom meeting is the best way to do that, okay? So that's it in terms of Zoom. You can do office hours too in your Zoom, you know, create recurring Zoom meetings for your office hours. And I, I know even though we're on campus in the fall, they are recommending office hours be on Zoom. Um, so you can do that here too. Okay, now each class you have, by the way, will have a different set of Zoom meetings. So if I go into my other class and I click on Zoom meeting, I will not see this MIS chapter one lecture one. This is specifically to this class. So you will have to set up your Zoom meetings, right, in all your individual classes. Um, if you are use, doing office hours, Okay, and if you set up your office hours in one class, the other class will not be able to get to it. So in a case like that, what you may want to do is maybe use your personal meeting ID and give that to your students and they can use the personal meeting ID inside of the Zoom app, which is external from Canvas to enter your office hours. Okay, so that's another thing you have to remember if you're doing office hours you'll have to do that using, you can still set it up inside of Canvas, but use your personal meeting ID so they have another way to get to it if they're not in that class that you set it up in, okay? Um, and that's it, anyone have any questions for Zoom? Um, to answer 
that question um, from, from Jen Arden. Hopefully I'm pronouncing that correctly. Again, if you go into settings, um, you may have to, maybe your, your Zoom meeting is down here. Okay, just have to click and bring it up so you have it up there. Okay, and then you should be able to see it on the left. Okay, if you don't see it there, I'm sorry? The problem is uh, I can move it up, but it does not so uh, at the list over there uh, for some reason. Hmm. Did you have to bring it up or was yeah. it already up there? Uh, I, I had to bring that up. Okay, so try, uh, once you bring it up, do a save and then um, you may need to do a refresh of your screen and then okay. hopefully it will show. I, I, I probably did not save it, okay. Uh, okay. Yeah, sometimes you have to do that refresh to get it to show up on the left. Mm. Bill, Bill, now it works, thank you. Okay, great. I had a question, Bill. Probably sure, Michelle. a very silly question, but the, so I wanna do my office hours over Zoom. When you say personal ID number, that means the student has to copy that ID and go into just the regular Zoom, not through Blackboard. Yeah. Correct? Yeah. So it's just that ID number and you use that for any uh, times you set up for your office hours. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, that, that should work for the office hours. Yeah. Um, there used to be a way that in Blackboard Collaborate, it used to give you a URL that I used to give to my other classrooms, but I don't think the Zoom does that. So you would have to, you know, maybe for office hours, maybe the best solution is just use the Zoom app. And I know it's not as secure as using it in Canvas, but um, that may be the best solution there. Okay, the other question I had yesterday was about Respondus. Now, the lockdown browser is one of the other things that is, uh, should be automatically on your list on the left-hand side. If it's not, again, just drag it up and save it. Now, those of you that aren't familiar with Respondus, this is a tool that we use that we can monitor our students um, taking uh, quizzes remotely. And um, now, the simplest form of the lockdown browser is it's, it's an external application. So it is something that they'll need to download. And if you go to my guide, I have at the, I think the very bottom, I give the link to download the Respondus browser. So you will have to give this link to your students. And this notice at the end of this, it has a query string that shows an identification code. This is the Stetson ID for Respondus. So if you click on this link, um, it will actually open up the Stetson University download um, but, uh, page where they can download the Stetson version of Respondus. Okay, and then what that will do is it will give them a browser that they will need to use. Okay, it's a lockdown browser. They'll need to use this to log into Canvas to take your quiz or exam. Okay. So uh, they'll have to download the lockdown browser. And when they open the lockdown browser, it's going to bring, now I can't open it because what it does is will lock down my entire system. So uh, I, unfortunately I can't, this is something I can't demonstrate, but if you click on the lockdown browser app, um, it's going to take you to the Stetson login when it loads. And then you just log in using your Stetson credentials. So they will need to know those. And then it will bring them to Canvas. And then they just use Canvas as they normally would. They go into your quiz and they take your quiz. Now on your end, what you need to do to set it up is you have to click on the lockdown browser link here on the left-hand side. And it should show all the quizzes that you set up. So these are all the quizzes I set up uh, during my demonstration in the past couple of days. And let's say I want the chapter one and two quiz to only be accessible through the lockdown browser. All I do is I extend this and I go to settings, okay? And by default, it says don't require respondents lockdown, okay? But I do want to require it, so I'm going to click on the second link here, okay? Notice it says access code. You have to be very careful with this. The access, if you want them to use an access code to access the, access the exam or the quiz, you inside of respondents, you put that code here. Do not use the access code option in the quiz in Canvas. 
um, you have to remove that. Okay, so just keep that in mind. If you want to use an access code for your quiz and you use Respondus, use this access code, not the one inside of the quiz. Okay, because then they will conflict and it won't work. Okay. Um, when you click on the advanced settings, here you can um, choose some additional settings. This is a new option that they just added. I'm glad they added this. It says require a lockdown browser to view feedback and results. What used to happen is if you had a lockdown browser set up for your quiz, they would have to go into the lockdown browser to access the quiz to see the results even after they took it. It looks like that's still a default, but if you uncheck this, then they can see the results in your feedback without going back into lockdown, which is nice. Um, so I'm glad they added this. Um, I would uncheck it. So this way, if they want to see your feedback, they don't have to bring up the lockdown browser again to see it. Okay, lock students into the browser until the exam is completed. Um, I would not recommend this. This basically means that they cannot exit the browser until they submit the exam. This can cause issues, especially if they're taking it remotely and they have some technical issue with the browser. Then what happens is if they need to come out of it, they're going to have to submit that exam. And maybe you don't want them to. Okay. Now I understand you may be thinking, well, then what happens if what's going to prevent them from closing the lockdown browser, looking up the answer and going back in? Well, nothing will really prevent that if you don't check this checkbox. But what happens is even if they, whenever they close the browser, they're going to have to put in an explanation. Okay. So even by not checking this, you will still know if they came out because it will tell you right inside of these responder settings after the quiz that they came out of the exam. And hopefully they put a good reason why they came out. Otherwise you can go to them and say, why did you come out of the exam? You know, and they can say, oh, well, I had a technical problem, okay? And maybe you'll let that pass for quiz one, but if that keeps happening, then if you start seeing a pattern, then you know, okay, this student's probably up to no good and they're coming out because they're looking up answers. So um, I've never really had much of an issue with this and I always keep it unchecked. Um, the downside about the Respondus browser is they do have a version for Windows, they have a version for Mac, they do not have one for, um, for the uh, Chromebook. So if you have a student that has a Chromebook, um, they're kind of out of luck. They can get a loaner from IT, but sometimes what I tell them is I say, okay, you don't have a Windows or a Mac, do you have an iPad? And they say, oh, well, I do have an iPad. Well, if you check this, they can actually take it with the iPad app because there is a lockdown browser iPad app that they can use. Um, allow access to specific web domains, okay. This one is if let's remember, this is going to lock down not only their computer, but it's going to lock down the entire web. Now, sometimes what I like to do is I like them to have access to MindTap. And because of that, I do actually check this and I have to put in the MindTap domain here where they can access MindTap from Respondus. Now, if you want to do this, it's a little involved because what you need to do is not only do you have to allow the web domain here, you're going to have to give them a link to MindTap inside the quiz or a link to your third party platform inside the quiz, which you can do in that instructions area. OK, that's a little involved. I'm not going to go into that just because of uh, the sake of time. But if you have if you're interested in having, let's say, open book quizzes where you want to give them access to the ebook, just send me an email and we can go over this uh, offline and I can show you how to do this, okay? Um, if you wanna enable a calculator, just check that, standard or scientific. And if you wanna enable printing, you can check that as well so they can print from the quiz. Okay, so these options here are just for the browser alone. Now, what if you actually wanna proctor them? You wanna see them as they take the quiz. That's when you would come down to this next area here, which is proctoring, okay? By default, the proctoring isn't on. But if you want to proctor, you would click this, require respondus monitor. And what this does is it sets up not only when they, when they start the quiz, not only will it bring them to the quiz in the browser, but it will also tell them, okay, 
You have to have a webcam up and running. It'll take them through a series of steps and we'll let them know that the webcam is going to be used to watch them as they take the quiz or the exam. These are all the different steps that it's going to go through before they can take the exam. So it's going to give them some additional instructions. Um, you can preview these instructions. This is what it's going to say. If you wanted to say something different, um, you can edit the text. Then it's going to give some guidelines and tips. The guidelines and tips is basically, you know, make sure you have the camera on, you're looking at the camera, um, avoid other people in the room, turn off television, right? things like that. Then it's going to ask them to take a photo. I do like to do this because I like to make sure, you know, it's, it's just a 10 second photo to make sure it is the student taking the quiz. The show ID, I don't do show ID. That's if they, you know, you want them to show their Stetson ID to make sure they're a Stetson student. The reason I don't do show ID is because we, most of the time I know what the students look like. We have pictures of them in my Stetson. So you know that that's the student. Um, you don't have to prove it. This would, I would think would be more if you teach it at just a strictly online university. But I mean, look, if you want them to show the ID, you can go ahead and check that. The environment check is pretty good. The environment check just tells them to take the camera and show the desk area around them. And they have about 10 seconds to do that. That makes sure if you don't want them to use any notes or books around the desk area, it's just them showing you that there's nothing there. Um, most of my quizzes and exams, I say you can have notes. Um, so I don't, I, I do have the environment check because what I tell them is I don't want another laptop sitting on your desk or I don't want your phone here so you can text your friend during it. So I like to make sure they don't have a laptop or any electronic device where they can communicate with the outside world on their desk. So I do have them do that, um, but I don't worry too much about the notes. And then the facial detection check, this is where the text their face and make sure that they're always looking in that direction during the quiz and they're not looking from side to side or they're not on another laptop. That's really nice because if they have another laptop and they're doing this, uh, and they're not looking at the camera, it's going to flag you, it's going to flag them and you'll see at the end after they're done taking the quiz, they have like a little meter and it shows that the meter will be in the red, which means, you know, this student was doing something strange during the quiz. And then you can go in and see exactly what they were doing. Sometimes they got up and left. Other times they're just looking away a lot. And, um, and that will show. Okay. Uh, now, again, you know, some argue, they say, well, this is a little intrusive. Um, I don't, you know, I, I don't like being able to monitor students or maybe the students, you know, they think it's too big brotherish and everything. Um, the way I explain it to them is I tell them that I don't watch the videos. I only have to look if it flags them. Okay. So if I see it, and, and that's a true statement. I mean, I, if I have 15 students, I'm not going to spend 15 hours watching them take quizzes. Okay. But the flag will tell me that the student, you know, something suspicious is happening here. And it takes you right to that portion of the video. So like I said, sometimes I'll click on it and I'll see the student's not even sitting there. And I'll send them an email and say, hey, you left during the quiz. And they'll say, oh, I had to use the restroom. And I'll say, okay, well, just, you know, make sure you use it before the quiz. It's just like I would tell them in a the classroom. And actually what I do explain to them is I tell them that I actually watch them less using this than I would in a classroom. Because in the classroom, I'm watching them all the time. Where here, I don't even watch it unless I get flagged. I kind of wish that there was an option where it would only show you those times where they get flagged, right? So then you can say, listen, as long as you're watching the camera, you're doing what you need to do, I don't even have access to the video. Um, but unfortunately, they don't have that. You can watch the whole thing regardless, but I only watch the parts that are in the red if I need to. And for the most part, most students are pretty good. Um, with this, uh, it's very rare that I even have to watch anything. There are times, especially at the beginning, where I have a student and they're on a laptop and I'll have to tell them, listen, if you have a laptop on your desk and you're looking for answers or if they're using MindTap, I'll tell them, listen, I give you a link to MindTap. If you're using another computer from MindTap, it defeats the purpose of me even using Respondas. So I may have to tell them that and then they know, OK, I won't use the laptop in the future. It usually works out pretty good. Now, there's a third option. This is brand new. Allow instructor live proctoring for the exam via Zoom, Teams, etc. 
I've never used this before, but if you're an instructor that likes to do live proctoring in an online class using Zoom, um, the downside of that is you don't know really what the student's doing on their computer. So even though you're watching them on Zoom, maybe they're still using Google or looking up answers. Well, what this option allows you to do is to still use Zoom, but they have to still have to uh, use the lockdown browser. So this is not necessarily going to record them like the second option is, but it does allow you to watch them and they still have to use the lockdown browser. Now, again, I've never used this before. So unfortunately, I'm not too familiar with, with how this would work. Um, uh, the, the, the downside of this is everyone does have to take it at the same time because you're watching over Zoom, whereas the second option, they can take it whenever they want. And, um, you know, maybe you have the quiz open all day and they, you know, it, and I do this like um, during the summer classes, you know, just take it this day and then um, it will record them and you can watch it later if you have to. So that's the difference between the second and third. Once you have saved this, then what it does is it will have a little um, um, message here that says respond as browsers required, okay, next to the quiz. And if you go to your modules, it will show chapter one and two quiz, respond as browser required. And if you click on it here, then, um, oh, I should go into the student view, sorry. Let me go to the student view. Okay, here it is. And if I click on it and I say, take the quiz, it's going to say, nope, you can't take it because it requires the lockdown browser. And then you have to download the browser to take it. And once you download the browser, um, you can um, go in and take it. Now, let me see, this link is probably not the correct link. Oh, it is. Oh, excellent. It even brings you to the Steth University link. That's perfect. Okay, good. So I don't think Blackboard did this. Blackboard actually had a message saying you needed a code. It was confusing. So this is more straightforward. And they click on this, they download it. And then once they're in the browser, the lockdown browser, and they go into Canvas, and then if they go to modules and click on that link, then it will take them to the quiz. And that's it. That's responded. So any questions on that? Bill, do you use that on all your quizzes or just some of your quizzes? I use it on all. As a matter of fact, I even use it in the classroom. In the classroom, I don't have to use monitor, of course. I could just use the browser. But this way, and when I use it in the classroom, I can make sure that they're only on canvas and they're not searching google for answers so i use it anyway even if it's an in class um, now this semester i may actually use the monitor too only because if a student's not feeling well right they have covid symptoms i don't want them coming to class for a quiz so i'm going to say you know what take it at home and you know monitors there and you and you can still proctor them using monitor mm -hmm. okay thank you Sure. Anything else? So that's it. That's basically how I set up my courses. Um, that's all the tools that I use. Canvas offers a lot more. And, um, you know, if you want, you can take the, you know, IT has a lot of um, scheduled trainings that you can take through ULIT, um, which they could maybe show you some more features of Canvas. Um, I do in my guide cover discussions and announcements. Discussions and announcements are very similar and um, there's really not much to them. So if you're interested in discussion and announcements, putting those in your classes, you can. Um, And I think that's about all that I did not cover from my guide. Um, a few other things just very quickly that I like in Canvas is the email feature. There's an inbox with an email feature um, that you can use to email your students and you don't have to use. Um... Now Blackboard had this too. 
The problem with the Blackboard email is it always sent my announcements or emails using a do not reply email address, and then students would try to reply to me through it. Uh, this does not do that. This one works a lot better. So I'm just so in the I'm so used to using the Outlook uh, for my email. Even when I send emails to my class, I haven't used this yet, but this is a feature I'll probably use um, in Canvas. And there's also a calendar feature too that they can use to set up meetings with you, um, which I haven't used yet. But um, but this is another nice feature of Canvas that I know Olet will go into if you're interested in that. Is the email feature in announcements? Uh, yes. So if you create an announcement, I believe you can send it out via email. Let me just make sure here. Okay. So that's like Ultra. I mean, uh, Blackboard, you could do that in Blackboard too. Yes, but you know what? I'm thinking now there may not be. I think announcements is only through announcements in, because I don't see the option to send it via email. So where is the email feature then? So what happens is with the announcements, um, they have to, um, if you go to, I think it's under account. If you go to your account settings, there is a setting. And I want to say that by default, it is set up. Let's say here it is global announcement or notifications. Okay, so if you go to your account notifications, there is an announcement Okay, so notify, as you see this notify immediately via email, I believe the student has this set up too by default. May want to check with IT on that, but I'm almost certain that this by default is set up. So any announcement that you send out, if they're a student of yours, they should automatically get that. So it's not an, it's not an option inside of an announcement in Canvas, um, but it is an option in the account settings. Okay. Okay. So just make sure that the, you know, this may be a question for IT. Just say, okay. listen, I want to make sure that the students are going to get that too. Yeah. Okay. I'll ask. Yeah. So, so Bill, what if you want to send an email to individual students and, um, you know, just one class? That would be inbox. So if you click inbox, see, now I have actually some emails here from a student. I had one student that did use it as a student. Um, and, and so it looks like it has all the classes here, but if you click compose a new message, you can select the course that you want. Um, so if I did, uh, these are my, well, let's see, favorite courses. So here's my fundamentals. So this is going to send it to this course only. But I can't tell when I do that in mine, they're all named the same. So I can't tell which section's which. Yeah, that's a good. Yeah, yeah. so you, you may want to. Come. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. The nicknames don't come through. Yeah, that's the problem. Oh. Mm. Okay. So this is the regular name. Okay. So now I did, you know, come to think of it, when I saw I didn't in, logged into Canvas yesterday after our session, I did see a notice that said that the sections are now identified. Did anyone else see that? And I'm thinking it had to do with what we spoke about yesterday. Let me see if I can bring that up again. Uh, Mine do not have section numbers. So they all look the same. Yeah, that's how mine look. I... And it's frustrating, I know. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, I'm wondering. It, I don't know if there's a way to bring back up the, um, oh, now I'm not looking at the right thing. Card view. Yeah, there was a message at the very top when I logged in and it said that sections have now been added to the course name or something along those lines. Bill, I just went to inbox Mm -hmm. and then chose favorite courses from up here yes okay and then it listed my nicknames okay good so it looks like from here you can find it, it. listed my nicknames yeah okay 
which is awesome. <laughs> Good. Okay. And so then you can help the other person out there who's having that same problem. So I have to nickname them? Yes. Otherwise, they'll just look like you're all the same. They're all the same. Oh. Yeah, remember I told yesterday those those three dots up there by the course name on the dashboard. Okay. Those three dots in the upper right hand corner. If you click that, nickname is one of the options. Yes. Okay. And then yeah. I just do like you know Monday, Wednesday, two thirty or whatever the time is, in there. And then when I go to the inbox, that's I list it as a favorite course. I star it like Bill showed us how to do. And then that name shows up. Okay. in your inbox and so how do you send it just to like one student if you needed to just get to one student okay. so if i can nickname them and find the section then i don't see Let, what let's see so i just chose the course and how about two as teachers are all hmm unless i'm choosing i oh send an individual message to each recent no i think that unless i'm choosing the wrong course let me choose one that I taught uh, here. I know people are in this one. Okay, so let me compose two students. Here we go. Okay, so that course I happened to choose didn't have students in it. This one does. So I go students and then it lists the names of the students. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and, and then I think, um, I wonder if I'm gonna, Try something here. I'm going to send one to myself. Because what happens is um, this will actually be sent to the inbox here, um, as well as your Stetson email. So, um, and I think you can reply to the Stetson email too, but I could be wrong. So let's see. Oh, I didn't see the one I sent to myself. That didn't come through yet. And I don't think it's in my Stetson email either. Okay, so take, oh, let's see, Stetson Canvas. Uh, okay, so it's taking a little long. Uh, it's not instant, it's not instant, but um, let's see if it's in my sent. Yeah, it's in my scent. But I think it should go through as your email, not like Blackboard. Blackboard used to have a do not reply. And students all the time would tell me, I, I sent you an email and I never got it because they would reply to my announcements, which was a do not reply email. But I believe this one works a little bit different because like I said, I did have that one student that used it and I would reply also through my Stetson email would work. So, um, but, but unfortunately, I don't have too much experience with it. Oh, it looks like I had, here it is. No, that's not it. Yeah, it still didn't go through. It's probably just taking a little long. All right. Um, so announcements show up in their Stetson email. It, yeah, Christy, as long as they have this, and, and unfortunately, I don't know for sure, but I would think they do because we do, inside of their account notification settings, and this is, this is outside of your course, um, they should have this bell that says notify immediately, which says when you send an announcement and a new announcement is sent in that course, that they're gonna get that email, okay? So, all right, and that's it. So if anyone has any other questions, um, you can always send me an email and set up an appointment and I, there's even a way now to do that through this Brown Center blog. Um, they have this faculty engage page and through faculty engage, you can, they have it under register for a meeting. I may change this to, you know, request consultation, but through here, you can put in your name and say, you want to meet with me and um, you can set up a meeting that way, or you can send me an email directly. Um, and there's also under resources, we have some faculty partners, uh, which is myself, uh, Petros Xanthopoulos and Nancy Barber, who were kind enough to also um, 
answer questions that you may have. So you can reach out to them as well um, if you have any questions about Canvas and setting up your courses because they, they've they had some experience and, and uh, should be able to help you. Okay. And that's it. Okay, so thanks everyone for attending.